you've gone sideways with them. I know. I'm, I'm about to fix it. <laughs> there we go. There no, we go. Hello. <laughs> Don't you love technology? Look, <laughs> good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Gott, and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you all. And there are a lot of you uh, watching this. Uh, to welcome you to the, to the library's virtual author event this evening with Kathy Lett, who you can see before you. But before we do that, uh, the Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which our library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging, and we acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. So once again, welcome everybody. And just a bit of housekeeping, unfortunately, owing to last minute uh, technical glitches, we can't have in program uh, questions, but if please feel free to leave comments or questions on the Q and A page of the library website, and they will forward them to both Kathy and to me, unless they are extremely unpleasant. Although maybe that would be fun too. <laughs> Kathy, <laughs> Kathy Lett needs no introduction, absolutely no introduction. However, there may be someone who is waking, blinking from a coma. So for, the, for that person, uh, Kathy has written 18 best-selling novels. Not, not, too, not too shabby. Young, <laughs> not I'm quite too interested. shabby. <laughs> and, and among those are, of course, uh, Puberty Blues, which was made into an incredibly successful film and an equally successful television miniseries, and Mad Cows, which was also made into a film, I believe, with Joanna Lumley in the yes. um, main role. Yeah. Wow. And Kathy has been translated into 17 languages and is yeah. rightly celebrated around the world as a comic writer who has both bark and <laughs> that we're here tonight to discuss Kathy's latest book, which is this one, Husband Replacement Therapy, which is a sensation Kathy. good title, I must say. So, Kathy, welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm intrigued by your room and your life because you're you're such an esteemed writer and artist. I should be interviewing you. No, I'm a simple soul, Kathy. Just a simple soul. Now, uh. <laughs> you're. Um, you manage in this book. I, look, first of all, up front, I have to say I love this book. Oh, I'm so this, glad. Thank this you. book is just full of laughter. But what you do is is something that not many writers achieve, and that is that you you manage to balance both high comedy and low comedy. And I love low comedy, <laughs> but all but but also pathos, and you mix those so beautifully. So without giving anything away, can you just give us the origin story of this novel and, and just briefly tell us pretty much what's going on in it? <laughs> well, the book, I wanted to write a book about women aging disgracefully, because I think for women, life is in two acts. And, and the trick is to survive the interval, which is the menopause, which is hideous. And when you're going through the menopause, you know, you sweat so much. She's like the Gestapo trying to get a confession out of you. <laughs> yeah. Through that phase, I think it's the best time of a woman's life because for the first time ever, you're no longer tethered to the kitchen by your heart and your apron strings. You can cut that psychological umbilical cord. Um, and with the, we're financially independent and with the rocket fuel of HRT, means we can actually um, take on the world. No pregnancy scares, no periods to worry about. And what happens to you um, hormonally, of course, is for a woman that her, her um, estrogen goes down and her testosterone mm. comes up mm. a little bit. So you get a little bit more bolshy, a little bit Ooh. more strident, a little bit more selfish, a little bit more like a bloke, basically. <laughs> and what that's happens rather, that's rather is, threatening. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys, you do rule the world. And there's a reason because you've got <laughs> that testosterone. But what happens to men at the same age is that their, their testosterone goes down and their estrogen comes up. And they often want to sit at home and nest. And women are like, I've nested. I've, you know, I've cooked 400 flocks of roast lamb. I've cooked 4,000 schools of salmon. I've added 4,000 acres of toast. You know, I want to go up Everest and, and, and along the Amazon and whatever. 
and so there's a big that so that's why the peak time for divorce is actually when the when the husband retires and it's women most divorces in australia are initiated by women and that so that's a big new um societal shift we have to address but also i just love the idea of adventure before dementia you know carpe the hell out of diem yeah, and what this yeah. coronavirus <clears throat> horror has taught us is that how precious life is and, and how you never know what's around the corner so have some fun so my book starts with ruby on her 50th birthday as you know because you, you've read it but i'll just give a little inkling to yeah, the yeah, yeah do because because it's just come out so i imagine most people listening to this may not have read it and they bloody well should Oh, well, I'm really pleased to say it's number one Australian um, adult fiction for two weeks running now. Brilliant. So Brilliant. I think the book is striking a nerve because, mind you, after seven weeks of lockdown, what woman doesn't want to recycle her husband right now? <laughs> because giving the room a sweeping glance is probably the closest you've got to housework. <laughs> and as for cooking, you know, every woman, if she's cooked three meals a day for seven weeks for the family, she's ready to impale that guy on a pork prong. I think chauvinist pig roasted slowly on a spit is probably you know, the recipe. Well, it's, it's a nice not smell. Love, not like, exactly. Well, not the lovely men watching this, because if they're watching this, they're good at girl talk and they're, you know, they're probably going to be ovulating by the end. But, you know, we love you. You're literally love God. So oh, I'm doing good. that. I'm doing that now, Kathy. You are I'm literally love God. I'm ovulating. <laughs> How are you? Even, <laughs> you? even as we speak. That's why you're so good at girl talk. Why I love <laughs> But anyway, the book, turn me back to the book. It starts on Ruby's 50th birthday. And she's very popular and she's fun and funny and everyone's come along for a good time. But she drinks too much and then it doesn't go quite to plan because she ends up telling everybody, when she gets up on stage to do her speech, telling everybody what she really thinks of them. The school mums, the yoga mums, her horrible mother who's totally vile, matriarch oh. of the as women wanna, need to go to pets to get their claws done. You know? Yeah, I want to talk about her. Okay. <laughs> and, and she talks about her sisters, how she's estranged from them. So then she also reveals she's just found out that day her husband's having an affair and also that she's got terminal pancreatic cancer. So it's a complete car crash. You know, she's cast off into social Siberia. And then she wakes the next day, chapter two, with a terrible hangover. A letter plops through the letterbox. She opens it, it's from the doctor's surgery saying, we are so sorry, we made a terrible mistake. That letter was sent to you by mistake. You're perfectly fine. And she's like, uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> but in her drunken stupor, she booked a cruise with her two sisters so she could patch things up before she died. So she just decides then she's going to keep pretending she's got cancer just to get the sisters on the cruise. So it's not until they get on the cruise that she realizes that she was so drunk. She took the first cruise leaving down to Sydney and it happens to be a cougar cruise. Now, this is a cruise where the women my age pay and the young guys go for free. They're called cubs. Now, so Kathy, did you, did, you make that up or is, did you make that up or is that a thing? These are real things. Real it's cruises. A thing. Most of them leave from Florida, obviously. And when cruising starts up again, I'm booking on to the very next one. But, you know, having these three sisters who are very different, building that car carnal, chaotic, chaotic um, comedy around them was so much fun so but you know as you say beneath the froth of the book and the fun and the girl talk is you know a more serious message which is what i always say to women is that yeah. um you know it's a celebration of the sisterhood women yeah. are each other's human wonder bras uplifting supportive making each other look bigger and better and you know with three sisters and as a passionate feminist you know, I, I celebrate the sisterhood in all my books. So the men don't come out of it that well. <laughs> <laughs> and not, and uh, nor, nor should they. Now, but what you, didn't, what you didn't mention in that, Tracy, Cathy, that it is also a very timely, overdue um, celebration of pubic hair. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and... If I may read you a passage that I just really love from you, if, I, if you don't mind me quoting your own words back at you. Oh, I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> um, at Ruby on the on this ship, she has a kind of a one night stand with um, a brainless person whose name is Waver, W-A-Y-V-E. He pronounces it Wave. I'm sure he does. <laughs> Anyway, they're having this one night stand and he's appalled. 
and and Ruby says, because Ruby is the voice of this novel, she says, judging by the intense look of revulsion on his face, Wave was thinking that waxing wouldn't be enough to achieve deforestation on the scale this situation required. No, my mons was obviously going to require several months of strategic bombing with napalm. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, 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 very funny. I'm so glad. What, I, what I'm thinking during the lockdown, too, because in Britain, we haven't been able to... In Australia, they said hairdressing was, a, was a, an essential service. So you could <laughs> yeah. get your hair done. But I know all the waxing salons were closed. Yeah. But walking yeah. around London, where I am right now, um, you know, people... It looks like the 1970s. The men have all got their big hairy beards, the long hair. The women have got hairy armpits, hairy legs. And I imagine they're hairy everywhere. So I'm hoping yeah. men have rediscovered the joys of a little light bushwalking. Well, exactly, Perhaps. exactly. Yeah. And you and know, man, you know, Kathy, they've that, even got into a little bit of you know bush tucker. <laughs> Precisely. You you know, with all this Brazilian stuff, the, the pubic louse is a threatened species. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's on a threatened species list, and I know that that is a challenging fundraiser, but you know, hey. Hilarious. Can I just say- <laughs> Extinction <laughs> Rebellion, <laughs> we've got to stop this. Can I just say there's still a lot of louses in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're also in that area as well. That is true. We, if we they keep come and go. <laughs> they come and go, exactly. But if we keep wasting, you know, the, 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 that wonderful Australian expression, the map of Tassie, will be no more. It'll be no more. It won't be anything. anything. And that's the only way the rest of the world even knows that Tasmania exists. <laughs> <laughs> now, another, one, one other thing that, that Ruby says, I don't know if it's Ruby, I think it's Ruby, but you, you do a kind of a, um, a turnaround on In Vino Veritas and you say very cleverly, drunken words are only sober thoughts. Now, Cathy, are you speaking from personal experience here? Totally, aren't you? <laughs> that, that the absolute truth, especially now when we're hooked up intravenously to a bottle of Chardonnay every night. There's been a lot of truth telling <laughs> with my friends. I mean, especially what? over Zoom, oh, the things they've been telling. Because I'm still, oh, really? I do all my research in a scientific, in depth fashion over cocktails with girlfriends. I've always yeah. done that. Yeah. And if I have any gift as a writer at all, I think it's putting into words what women are thinking and not necessarily saying out loud, but yeah. also writing da down the way women talk when there's no men around. You know, and it's a great male myth that women aren't funny. And I've heard this in every country I've been on book tour in the world where some male journalists will say to me, oh, you know, you say you write funny books and women aren't funny. And I think, why do some guys still say that? I think they're terrified what women are being funny about. I think they presume we spend the entire time talking about the length of their members, which is yes. not true. Because, you know, we no. also talk about the width, which yes. after childbirth, so oh, much more right. important, so much more important. <laughs> That's right. But when women are together and they're drinking, you'd be amazed what we tell each other. I mean, I, it's a big difference between male and female humour. Like my male friends, like you, uh, I'm counting you as a new friend. You Thank are you. very funny, really clever. And, but you, men tell to sort of tend to tell set jokes. Yeah. I call it the black belt in tongue foo. You know, they're mm. firing off these great one liners and things. Women don't really do that. When we're together, our humor is much more confessional, much more cathartic, very self deprecating, and incredibly candid and hilarious. I mean, when you go on a girl's night out, you have to be hospitalised from hilarity. But we do strip off to our emotional undies in about 3.6 seconds, and it's a psychological striptease that reveals awe. And that's why when you're on a girl's night out, everyone will be laughing and laughing and cackling like kookaburras, but then we'll also suddenly be hugging and crying. Is yes. that too? That's what I try and do in my books. I have the comedy and the pathos, the humour and the pathos together, because that's real life, isn't it? It is. But I think also it, it may actually be true that women actually listen to each other you know in a way that perhaps men don't i think that's true because because men maybe are not particularly interested in the response 
<laughs> I think that's true, I'm sad to say. And I've been at dinner parties so often where a woman will say something funny and the men don't respond. Then a man will say exactly the same thing and all the men will laugh. And women will be going, she just said that. She just said that, yeah. She just. Well, I've that. also been at parties where a man will say to a woman, um, he'll, she'll tell, say something funny and he'll say, you know, women can't tell jokes. He'll put her down <laughs> with the husband, right? And I'll say, yeah, the reason women don't tell jokes is because we married them or something like that. Like, yeah. Back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's what's your what's your lockdown experience being like? What's what's the the best thing and the worst thing? Um, the best thing has been family family time in a way because you know yeah. it was all the mothers watching, all the parents watching will attest when you have young living with young people. I mean, it's been years since I've seen their faces because all I see is the top of their heads yes. because they're constantly doing this. Yes. So that, it's, that makes it's, its way into the book, in fact, doesn't it? That observation. It does. Yeah. It's so great to remember what they look like. That's been really good. And we've been making a lot of family fun because I have an autistic son, Jules, and, and of course it's been very hard for him. Because mm. if we neurotypicals are finding um, the lockdown hard, imagine how hard it is if you suffer from anxiety. I mean, that's been really, really difficult. So yeah. at night time, yeah. we, tend to, we tend to dress up. We, ha- we all come as our favourite rock star and you have to guess who we are and we sing or we come as our favourite movie star or, you know, so we're making, we're, I'm called, my, my friend Polly Sampson, who's a writer, she calls it the Von Trapped family. So that's what we're all about. Yeah. So that's been the best thing. The hardest thing has been for me missing my book to it because I was going to have this fantastic yeah. book party in Sydney. I was going to be carried in by eight gorgeous love gods and sequin budgie smugglers and we were going to swing off the chandelier with a toy boy between our teeth. You know, and instead, I've been doing it all by Skype at one, two, three, and four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to remember what my name is. So that was really disappointing. And also the great thing when I'm on Book Tour in Australia, I get to meet my readers. And it's so flattering because my, my readers are the most wonderful women. In, you know, they're funny, feisty, fiercely loyal. They're just fabulous. And we just, we, usually after every book event, we end up going to the pub or the bar and they tell me all the, they bring me up little anecdotal doggy bags they've saved up from the little stories I might like. And, you know, it's just an absolute joy. I adore them all. So, yeah, I've really missed that this time. Yeah, we were supposed to do this at live at yeah. Geelong back in March. And it was... I know, it would have been so um, much fun. It would have been so much fun, yeah. Yeah. Because you and I bonded. <laughs> we have bonded. I can... <laughs> you can come oh. on a girl's get out with us. Oh, I'm, I'm totally my there. Brain totally there My <laughs> <laughs> but um the book back to the book <laughs> back to the book tell me about the mother the mother she really does look make Medea look like mary poppins where did she come from <laughs> well i'm actually very close to my mother who's fabulous and i've got three sensational sisters so the book is not autobiographical oh i i I know the acknowledgements make that quite clear at the end of the book that the acknowledgements are a celebration of your relationship with your oh, sister. We're and so with your close. Mother. Yeah. But a lot of my female friends don't have a good relationship with their mother or their sisters. And it's such a source of sadness and grief for them. So I do hear a lot about those dysfunctional families. They usually put mm-hmm. the fun into dysfunctional. You know, yes. It can be quite yeah. funny. But it it's, it's, uh, was great um, comic material to explore because when you are sisters, loyalty is, is coded into your DNA. So you, you have to love each other in a way, but also, you, you know, you're so different, you can fall out, and, but then you've got to try and put it back together. So you've got this constant accordion of love, hate, love, hate. And that's really good fun to write about. And the mother, as, as I explained towards the end of the book, if she'd had a career, she's kind of like a Hedda Gabler character. Mm. You know, a woman with so much brains and smarts and potential and energy, but nowhere to direct it, as a lot of that generation were like that. I mean, when I was growing up, my mother was the only one of my, my, in all my friendship group, she was the only mother who worked. And she had a full-time job as a headmistress at infants and primary school. Um, But that was very unusual. Mothers in those days were decorative and demure, you know, and they were kind of, they were sort of draped over their husband's arms like a, like a human handbag, something attractive. Yeah. So, you know, thank God for Jermaine Greer who came along and just kind of, that she's like a front row forward feminist, you know, a bull. <laughs> and she just went out there and said, women are worth more than that. And so all my books from Puberty Blues on have said the same thing, that women are more than just a life support system to a pair of breasts. 
So, you know, and it's, it's, it's 100 years since Emily Pank has tied herself to the railings. We still don't have equal pay. We're still getting concussion hitting our head on the glass ceiling. Yeah. And we're supposed to clean it while we're up there. Yeah. So anyone who calls herself a post-feminist has kept her wonder bra and burnt her brains because we still have a long way to go. <laughs> but as you know, I always say to we, we women, we don't whinge about it though. I mean, my only motto is laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and you get salt in your shampers, which we definitely don't want. But I think women have got a lot to whinge about, starting with being the butt of God's biological joke. I mean, just think mm. of all the things women go through for when you first get taken hostage by your hormones as a teenager, you know, once a month. Then there's pregnancy where you swell to sumo wrestler proportions. Then there's childbirth where you stretch your birth canal to customary, what, five kilometres? Then there's mastitis. Then there's the menopause. And then just when everything goes quiet, do you know what happens? You grow a beard. How can that be fair? You know, that's what my new hobby in lockdown is making a macrame hanging basket arrangement with what's going on here. So, you know, God is definitely a bloke. I so think God is definitely a bloke, yeah. yeah well, you've certainly, you've certainly cured any sense that I might have had that being a woman <laughs> might be fun. Well, we do get multiple <laughs> orgasms. Oh, that is true. We do that have that. That is true. And we do uh, have no, the clitoris, no. which is the only bit of the human body that exists purely for pleasure. You yeah. know, I am a member yeah. of the clitorati. That, so that's <laughs> two upsides, I think. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm not going to challenge that. That is absolutely <laughs> on the on the money. Well, that we, if it was just easier to find, that's all. Um, Kathy, <laughs> um, in your book, look, I I'm a sentence kind of chap. I love a decent sentence, a beautifully crafted, well turned sentence, of which there are many in this book. And I'm not just talking. I'm not just talking about the zingers either. I'm talking about. Um, other sentences. And I'm a fan, I know this might sound um, a little weird, but I'm a fan of euphonious lists in novels. I love them. And think, think of the, in The Great Gatsby, there are, I think it's four pages or three pages of lists, a list of all the people who went to Gatsby's party. And it's the best part of that book. Now, in your book, there's a very euphonious list. Is that and part what it is. It's, well, there are two lists. One of, one of them is long and one of them is, is short. And I'm just going to read this one. It's about the wellness industry. And I want to talk to you about your view of the wellness industry, because I think this is a bit of a giveaway. And Amber, who's one of the sisters, you, you, say, you say this about her. Amber went in for exotic facials with obscure ingredients. Her most recent fad was discarded foreskins collected from South Korean circumcisions. We'll come back to that. Amber believed that most things in life could be cured by a mix of Pilates, chakra yoga, yoga lattes, acupuncture, angel channeling, astrological charting, craniosacral therapy, meditation, mindfulness, Reiki, swearing off carbs, and giving half your annual salary to a self-styled intuitive heart healer who would awaken your inner warrior. Emerald, the sister on the other hand, felt most things could be cured with a Xanax tablet and a vodka bottle. She's my kind of girl. Now, my now, tell, <laughs> <laughs> tell, me about that, tell me about that list. Where did that list come from? How many of those things have you tried? Oh, well, over the years, I mean, I was a hippie, weren't we all, you know, when I was a teenager, I went through a hippie phase. And, you know, I, I was a hippie until I got a kind of third eye infection. Because so much of it was yeah. complete rubbish. <laughs> but, you know, you do, you do find um, people still get sucked into all of that rubbish, you know. And yeah. I think if you really want to learn more about yourself and feel better about yourself, do something worthwhile you know volunteer do something for a charity yeah. that'll make you feel so much better than sitting in the lotus position chanting in my view so they had to come in for a bit of a serve yes you know, <laughs> I, think I, I blow raspberries at a lot of things that's just one of the things i was hitting with my my quiplash there is there is one thing that's missing from that list that's very big at the moment in the wellness community what is it's it it's called perineal sunning no way yes yes way you go out into your backyard 
and you put your knees behind your ears and hope that the neighbours aren't watching or maybe hope that the neighbours are watching. I don't know. Honey, the biggest and, opening night in, in, in Australia. Well, you know, it's not something I could... I'm not limber enough to put my knees behind my ears. I mean, if, if I could do that, I'd be so proud. That would be my passport photo. But I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> and the worst thing is that's going to enable so many people to go around saying that the sun really does shine out of their ass. But it do, yes, I know. Yeah, that's a good thing. But yeah, also, but I don't, I, I'd love to see the sun, the Cancer Council's campaign. For that. Exactly. <laughs> that's a, that's a melon. Cancer Council one year. I, I, I'd love to be doing that campaign. <laughs> that, that's a melanoma that's hard to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, th this is how crazy some of these ideas are. That, that, I, that we were talking about the Korean foreskin facial. That is a true yeah. thing. Yeah, I, I have it, heard it, of it. I have heard it, of it. It's really expensive. But yeah. also, I think it explains why there's just so many dickheads in Hollywood. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> well, precisely. Pay no more. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is the like library Gwyneth, thing Gwyneth Paltrow, Yeah, this is like Gwyneth Paltrow's candle. Oh, my goodness me. I know. Excuse I know. me. This yeah, is going to happen again. The candle that's supposed to smell like yeah, her vagina. like her vagina. I know. <laughs> I, I mean, want to get a can candle, candle labia. She's having the kind of candle in Labia. Yes. There's a miracle about that. It's funny, isn't it, that she doesn't seem to understand the difference between those things. Gwyneth, what can I say? What can you say? I, mean, I don't know. They have so much Botox and bleach that it, <laughs> it sinks into their brains. It's the only explanation I can possibly think of. Now, Kathy, this is also a book about being a mother. All of the women in this book are mothers and this is a book about being a mother what wisdom do you have about being a mother right i suppose what i would say is out the door by 24 get the kids out of the house so that you know let them fly the nest mine haven't this is just what i would like to have happen. yeah 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 out the door by 24 so you get your life back um, and I think don't feel guilty. You know, mothers, as, as soon as you become a mother, your guilt gland throbs constantly. Yes. You know, are you good enough? Are you a good enough mother? You know, you've got to be a tiger mum or a helicopter mum, an earth mother. You know, there's so many roles we have to fulfill. I'll know we've got equality when I hear a man agonising about how he's going to juggle kids and career. I've never heard a man ever utter that sentence. But I would say to mums, do not feel guilty. If you can get your kids to 16 and they're not um, Scientologists, heroin addicts or collecting Nazi memorabilia, your yeah. job is done. You should get a mothering medal. But I think the hardest thing too is for mothers of teenage daughters because when, you, when your girls become 13 or so, they get taken hostage by their hormones and they hate their mothers. If they turn into a till of the teen. And um, it's heartbreaking for mums when daughters reject them. They come back, like when they get through the teens. My daughter's 27 now and we're, I adore her. We're really close and she's wonderful. But those teen years, it's like living with the Taliban. You're not allowed to laugh, sing, dance, wear short skirts. And when I'd be going out somewhere, I'd have on my little pink leopard skin mini skirt, you know, going out to meet the girls. And I'd know she wouldn't approve. So I'd creep down to the front door. And if she heard me, she'd come running behind me and say, what are you wearing? Go back to your room. You're not going out dressed like that. I remember one day I said to her, but surely my legs are okay. I can still wear a short skirt. She said, it's not the legs, mom. The skirt doesn't go with your face. <laughs> Low self-esteem is hereditary. You get it from your teenage daughter. But my top tip, I'm getting to my top tip. For any mother who's having a terrible time with her, daughter you know if she if she has been taken hostage by her hormones next time she hits you and kicks you and says i wish you'd just die just take a big drag on a cigarette a big gulp of wine and say i'm doing my best darling <laughs> yeah and i'm going to beat you to it <laughs> <laughs> That's my <problem. laughs> but do you think i mean i've been thinking that that when you when you see your child for the very first time you fall so deeply, passionately, and instantly in love with that child. Yeah. As, as we grow up, I sometimes think that, do we ever return that in kind to our parents? Do we ever really oh. give that back? Oh, I think you do. I, but I don't think you really appreciate your parents until you have your own children. 
And that's when you understand the level of love that's been lavished on you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's definitely it's true in my case. I mean, my sisters, my three sisters and I adore our mother and our father who sadly passed away some years ago. But, and it, but it really wasn't until I became a mother that I truly, truly learned to worship the water she walks on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think I actually learned to, to really understand all the sacrifices that my parents made until I was well into my 30s. Well, yeah, it's tragically true. But luckily, Australians live on, we have great longevity, so we've got plenty of time to make up for it. Especially, I was a terrible, terrible teenager, my poor mother. You know, I was climbing out of the window and I was going in panel vans and I was running away. And, you know, I left school at 16. I was a yep. straight student and I left school at 16. You know, I always say that the only examination I've ever passed is my cervical smear test. Ha ha. But it broke my mother's heart when I left school because, you know, yeah. I was, I'd been school captain, you know, but then I discovered boys and hormones and I was off. But um, I, I keep saying to her now, have I nearly made it up to you, mum? You know, when I take that <laughs> take her to lovely you know nights away down the coast or you know get books signed for her by ian McEwan or Tom <laughs> i'm like i made it up to you mom she goes mm, really really yeah, I, I was gonna say i hope she says yeah <laughs> not quite <laughs> you're getting there you're getting there <laughs> we do the crossword every day by skype we did the oh, times and crosswords yeah she's a she's a cruciverbalist like me yeah so we, we do, we keep, we're very close, even when we're separated by distance, we're, we're very close. Yeah. My mum does the Times crossword every day. She's, no, she's, yeah, it's, yeah, she's it's 95, fun. but she, she wow. does it every day. Incredible. Isn't it great? My mum's 88. You should do it with her. It's a lovely thing to Skype and just sit and do the crossword no, together. My, my mother can't do any kind of technology. She, oh, okay. she can't do so phones. Thick, or, thick, carry you know, a pigeon. Yeah, carry a pigeon. Yeah, even that's a bit, you know, a bit advanced. Well, we need we need to get back to your we need to get back to your book, Kathy. We're, we're, we're losing sight of this fabulous book, uh, Human Replacement Therapy. Um, husband, HR. Did I say, say human? Therapy. I mean husband. Yeah, human. Yeah, you got to say, say the human. HR because that's the joke. HR yeah, that's the joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what what I what I think I mentioned this before. What what I really loved about it is that you managed to, even though it's it's highly comic you managed to smuggle in some really serious and really moving stuff. And I, I say surprisingly moving only because it kind of comes out of nowhere and sideswipes you suddenly. And it's really beautiful. And there's stuff in there about Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, um, and, and other examples as well. And in, in the voice of, I think, I think, I think it's Emerald, she says uh, about... It is, it is Emerald. She says, women have been mercilessly subjugated by the patriarchal theonomy for too long and now it's our turn. Do you, <laughs> and behind, behind that joke, behind that joke, there's, there's a kind of a serious thing. Do, do you think that the patriarchal theonomy, a theonomy for people who don't know, is, is just sort of divine law, like a divine rule that it's men who run things do you think that patriarchal theonomy is being slightly eroded or is it still oh, is i it wish still... I mean, I'm, i've got to explain emerald is the intellectual sister she's she's yeah. advanced, very scientific and very practical so she's the one who comes out with these statements yeah um and and i have a sister who's very scientific and she's great and makes me laugh a lot so she she kind of vaguely inspired that character but not 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 a dose. She's not. She's not. She's not a having her beefcake and eating them too. I hate. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I do think well, because the women are so. Some of the sisters just devour the men on board. It's like a boy buffet. You know, yeah. there's a lot of carnality going on. <laughs> yeah. I thought. I thought someone's going to attack me for being sex reverse sexism. You know, but oh, there is a no. truth in that. That it's our turn. Come yeah. on. Yeah, and so but, but, you, know, but, you guys but, haven't had. You don't yeah. wait for centuries but yes the patriarchy is alive and well we have a pussy grabber for a president yes so we still have harvey weinstein type predators in every workplace yes we don't have equal pay as i said violence against nope. women is, is so horrific especially now during lockdown it's accelerated mm. so you know we still have a lot to fight for but we're, and women feminists are not anti-men you know the thing is that the world's not going to change until men join us at the barricades because yeah. we've been saying the same thing i've been saying the same thing since i was a teenager and we still don't have equal pay so you know men sometimes men say to me oh you know you feminists want too much what do we want equal pay that'd be great thank you very 
very much. Yep. We'd like men to work out that um, Mutual at Orgasm is not an insurance company. That'd be no, great. That'd very be much. good. Yep. Very good. We'd like them to help around the house more because and that's also in men's interest because it's scientifically proven that no woman ever shot her husband while he was vacuuming. Yes. And we'd like them to actually do a little light housework, a little, a little sort of cooking in the kitchen because do something sensitive with snow peas because the way to a woman's heart is through her stomach. That's not aiming too high. Men always say to me, what do women really want in bed? Breakfast. Breakfast and a really good book, which I just happen to have one right here. <laughs> but, you know, I don't think that's a lot. Do you? No, it doesn't strike me as a lot at all. And the thing about this book is that it is not, it is not anti-men. No. This book at all. I mean, it's, it's anti a particular kind of man and so it should be but no, you know the, cool. the, 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 bloke, the, the blokes on that cruise they're just like i don't know they're, I can, yeah. they're just carbohydrates in in um <laughs> budgie well, smugglers well, really aren't they do you do you think that the me too movement has possibly created a kind of complacency among either men or women, that things are moving in the right direction? Yeah, I think it has, because those top-order predators are still there. They've just slithered down under the rock. Yeah. They're still there, and they'll be back. You know, and, and I always say to women, with time we said to men, we no longer want your, your seats on, on the bus. We want your seats on the board. You know, move over. And, yeah. and that's why I believe in quotas, because I don't think will change until we have you know good quota systems because it's still men making the decisions at the top so yeah it's a very slow process but the one thing that does change men is when they have daughters and they realize how clever their daughters are mm. you know my dad was <clears throat> front row board for the bulldogs and and you know he wanted four sons but he got four girls well he became a feminist pretty damn fast because he the thought of us sitting next to a man in the workplace who was half as bright as us and earning twice as much just infuriated him so you know men learn <laughs> they learn when they're actually exposed to the reality that women face every day <laughs> but you know the sexism sorry to interrupt you. i was going to say the sexism is sewn into our psyche you know it, a, a man who's good at work is a go-getter you know leadership material a woman who's good at work who's, who's strident and strong is a ball breaker and a bitch and she's ambitious that's the word that women always get ambitious mm -hmm. and you, that sexism it, it or we have the same um double standards when it comes to sexuality you know a man who's sexually active this is the same from puberty blues days till now it hasn't changed a man who's sexually active is a romeo a lothario a love god a stud muffin a spunk rat as we say in the shire mm -hmm. a woman with the same sexual appetites is a slut a tart a tramp a mole you know, men still expect you to be so virginal. They're like, oh, darling, darling, am I the first man to make love to you? To which the woman replies, of course. I don't know why you men keep asking the same silly question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. while, we're on, while we're on that track, this book is also, this book is about so many things. And one of the other things that it's about is about couples and how people relate in couples. And there's a marvellous line in it where, um, I, I think it's Ruby again, who, who says that uh, there's a word for couples who tell each other the truth at all times, divorce. Divorced. <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> so what is, the, what is the role, Kathy? What is the role of honesty in a relationship? Of honesty? Oh, <laughs> yeah. there's, well, there's, there's no real role for honesty in the bedroom. Like if someone says, does this new lingerie make me look fat? There is only one answer to that, no. <laughs> Am I good in bed? Is anyone answer to that? Yes. Well, there, I mean, are, there are two answers, but there's only. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get laid again? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, not so much lying is just discretion and um, selective honesty, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, marriages last so long now. You know, from honeymoon to tomb can be like. 60 70 80 years yeah so it's a long time to find one person's anecdotes interesting <laughs> <laughs> and i don't see divorce as a failure either i just see it as a change you know, yeah oh yeah marriage to dismantle a marriage i've done it twice and it's really painful and really hard but you have that's the time you do have to be honest about how things are going and what you really want from life 
Um, did, did you say that the statistic is that, that women are beyond a certain age, they are the drivers behind the divorce? Yeah, yeah. In Australia, the, well, and most of the West, Western countries, actually, majority of divorce is initiated by women. In, yeah. in China, for example, after the lockdown, divorce rates have skyrocketed. Um, and it's 74% of the divorces were initiated by women. Now, where yeah. Wuhan goes, the world does tend to follow. Yeah. And I think after the lockdown, we're going to see a Zoom boom, a baby boom, a hot lot of terrible novels. And yeah. also oh, God. Huge, yeah, I know, I dread it. And a huge spike in the divorce rate. Yeah. Because, yeah. You know, when, when, um, if couples are uh, fortunate enough to have a cleaner, for the first time not having a cleaner and the, the wife has realised how little the bloke is actually contributing around the house, especially when yeah. she's homeschooling as well. You know, the, most of the men I know um, who were homeschooling, they took PE, which meant they'd go outside and make the kids ride the bikes up and down the streets and they'd play games on their phone, you know. Yeah. So women are really at the tipping point now of thinking, is it just like having another child? Yeah. Not all folks. I hasten to add. I, I, might I don't know. So domesticated. And he's kept... <laughs> he's kept the whole this um, whole house going you know he's wonderful there's a lot of fabulous guys out there but the majority we know from all the research that most the heterosexual men have increased their contribution to housework by about 3.6 seconds a week yeah. so you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of um resentment out there yeah and I, do, and I told you i do all my research in this in-depth way but yeah. what i discovered from a lot of my girlfriends is that they're just not having sex with their husbands i mean they've been self-isolating mainly from their spouse but even before that, because if you've worked all day, come home at night, cook the dinner, found the lost sports kit, you know, defrosted the chops for tomorrow, put the washing on, done the ironing, put the cat out, read all the bedtime stories and done the teeth cleaning, nagging, did a digital detox for the teenagers. By the time you get into bed, the one th thing you're fantasizing about is sleep. And then you get the hand coming over and you think, oh no, not the hand, you know. <laughs> men make horror movies called The Blob and The Thing. Yeah. Exhausted mums would make, uh, do you think here's this guy he hasn't talked to you all day or helped you around the house and he thinks you're in the mood for love you're in the mood for running him through with a carving knife yeah so, yeah you know, that's the reality <laughs> and then there's a, this is another one of your lovely lists which i'm going oh. to quote back at you <laughs> this, oh. this is this is ruby again and she's in bed with her husband harry oh i remember this yes in bed one night as harry labored above me my nose tucked into his shoulder. I, tucked off, I ticked off all the experience in life which were overrated. Oysters, yodeling, experimental opera, expressive dance, sorbet, cricket, eventually concluding that there was nothing as insipid as sex with a husband when your heart is not in it. It was like dancing with no music. Now, what I love about that little list is it's funny, and then it's got that really kind of melancholic twist at the end. So, and I, I love that. I regret yodeling being in there. I'm not quite sure how you can be. Can you yodel? Yodeling. Can no, you I yodel? I can't yodel. <laughs> but, but I'm quite. I'm right. Quite, I'm quite fond of yodeling. I know you guys yodel. <laughs> yodeling does have its place, especially if you're with a lonely goat herd at the time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I love I love the fact that you're picking all these little bits out of the book. I, mean, I haven't read it for six what? months. It's really lovely. You probably to hear. can't. You probably can't even remember them. Well, thank you. It's very, very, <laughs> very generous of you. It's very. Not very at kind. all. Not at all. Um, what speaking of things that are overrated, what in your view is the most? I love asking this of other writers. What is the most overrated virtue? Gosh, well, I'm not good at, I'm not that good at virtues, <laughs> actually. I'm better at vices, but yeah. I think it's got to be chastity. Yep. I mean, I mean, first of all, they only ever inflict chastity on women right through history. We're the ones who had to be good, and you guys got to have all the fun. You could be a rake. You could sow your plantations of wild oats, but we had to stay good and chaste. And also, you know, the best thing about sex, it's free. I mean, so actually, the best things in the world are free. Laughing, walking, talking. Yodeling. Water, oxygen. Yodeling. And, yodeling. Yodeling. <laughs> and sex. You know, fantastic. Yeah. So no, I would have to say, especially in the lockdown, people have been discovering their new hobbies, you know, yeah. gardening or painting. Or, but a lot of couples I know 
on, on a happy note have rediscovered sex because they've they've because they've had time because normally kid and career juggling and long commutes you know if they're a loving couple they've yeah. actually kind of rediscovered each other i'm, I'm calling it the corona sutra <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, I would say, Chassie, what would yours be? Oh, I think, I think without a doubt, uh, piety. I think, piety, yes. I think pious people are so boring. If you've yes. ever had dinner with, with someone who's pious, you just think, oh no, no. And they're always the ones who turn out secretly to be running off to brothels at night being whipped. Oh, with letters. yes. Exactly. Or whatever they do. They're, they're usually yeah. found in an airport toilet having fellatio with someone inappropriate. That is it's so true. Tricky. That, that is so true. So, yeah, I think that's a good one. Well, <laughs> we should get everyone who's watching, write in and tell us what your least favourite virtue is and why. Yeah. That would be yeah. a whole book out of that. Yeah. And what's the most underrated vice? The most underrated vice... Gosh, well, all the vices are rated very highly in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Lust, gluttony, greed. Oh. <laughs> I don't, I mean, they're, all, they're rating them all high with me. What about you? What would you oh, say? Oh, I don't know. I think maybe murdering pious people. That, that's a bit underrated. <laughs> You're just the most fun. I cannot wait to go out with you. We can laugh our lips off. Cathy, we've only like got a... a Diet won't be the Atkins diet, it'll be the Talkins diet. We'll talk so much <laughs> dinner and dinner until we look quite pious, actually. <laughs> we've only got a few minutes, we've only got a few minutes left. This has gone so fast, but I do have just a couple more questions. Where do you feel most competent? This isn't about the book anymore, this is about you. Where do you feel most competent? Competent or when I'm when mm. I'm well, lots of things disco dancing, flirting, swimming, surfing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I take a lot of pleasure out of a lot of things and that, that I feel at this age, if I'm not good at them, I would have given them up. You did say competent, right? <laughs> yes, competent. I did say, I did say competent. Yes. Well, I am a swimmer. Competent. I am a swimmer. I, I, are you a I swimmer? I swim the day in Sydney, yeah, or ocean swimming. I love swimming. Oh, uh, you see. I oh, love I... dancing. Dancing's like the disco diet. You can eat whatever you like as long as you dance all night. So I'm big yeah. on that. A lot of dancing. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just not an ocean swimmer. I, I stand on the edge of the ocean and all it's saying to me is come in and die, land boy. That's all <laughs> I hear. Well, well uh, the reason Australians swim for, so fast is it's something much bigger is always trying to eat us. So, you know, well, you that, that, <laughs> that's true. Okay. So where do you feel most incompetent? Most incompetent? Yeah. Oh, I don't feel this. Oh, well, in the kitchen, in the kitchen, without a doubt. When I first moved in with Jeffrey, when I fell in love with Jeffrey Robertson, he was going yeah. out with Nigella Lawson at the time. Right. And uh, <laughs> she's such a brilliant cook. And I used my smoke alarm as a timer. Oh, me too. Right. So, and I tried hard to learn to cook, but it was just always a complete disaster. I remember one, because I just moved to England. I didn't have any friends here, really. I had a couple of friends. I had Salman Rushdie and Hanif Qureshi and a few writers I knew from around the circuit in Australia, you know, Faye Weldon. Yeah. But I didn't really have a lot of friends. I was trying to make friends. And so I'd have dinner parties. And I had so many disasters. One day we were all upstairs drinking champagne. I had the, I'd been stuffing the Arabian lamb with things and sewing it up and putting it. Was all right. And then I went downstairs and discovered the oven had been on a self-timer and had turned itself off. So we didn't eat until about three o'clock in the morning. And that's when I thought, this is not my natural habitat. No. So what I do now, well, I've got a lovely boyfriend who cooks now, but what I, what I do if he's not here, I get really good champagne, really good ingredients. I put it all in the fridge. I get everyone around. We drink and laugh and carry on. And then at some stage I say, I suppose we should eat. What have we got? And I open the fridge and everyone comes to see what's in there. And I pretend to help for a few minutes. And then I just kind of step slowly way because there's always some guy there who wants to show you you know the hat that is you know the ultimate aphrodisiac for a woman is a man in a cooking apron there'll always be some guy <laughs> who wants to show yeah. off so that's i keep saying it to all the women watching you know pretend to help me yeah. and they'll take over yeah anyway people who come for the food who cares well, that's right. it's not about the food it's no, never you come for the human menu and the food for thought. And exactly. I always have a good human menu. I have exactly. prime ministers and pop stars and, you know, um, I'll just hold poets and exiled people on the run, prisoners. You know, you always mix it in like a human minestrone and it's going to be a good night. 
<laughs> You're coming next time. <laughs> I'd love to. Now, Kathy, tell me honestly, is there a book? What book is there that you feel you ought to have read that you haven't read or that you got halfway through and you thought, nah, nah, can't the Pickwick do this. Papers. Pickwick Papers. The Pickwick Papers. Oh, the tedium. I mean, <laughs> honestly, Pickens is brilliant. Yeah, he not is at, brilliant. Not at comedy. Comedy, that's supposed to be his comedic romp. Oh, mm -hmm. I went into a coma. And, and the other one that puts me into a coma is Trollope. Trollope. Oh, I mean, no, Cathy, I'm disappointed. No, no, no. All those, <laughs> you like lists, that's why. He's listing everything, <laughs> paid by whom and like how much you wear. And oh, my God, that put me into a coma. But I, I wasn't, and there's other modern books too. Like I read Normal People, Sally Rooney. Yeah. And I know that I talked of as the book of the moment. But that also, I thought, was, it's just... People are either having sex or they're reading. I mean, yeah, that put me into a coma because it's so much sex. I was a coma, sexual. But yeah, I mean, no, I have a low. My only commandment is thou shalt not bore. And if you notice my books, they go, they go along fast. Oh, they do. <laughs> they flick they do. along because I know people have a lot of, it, lot of um, things they've got to do in their life. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to keep them. They're like a mental macchiato. When I go to Italy, I get, I've get i been described there by my Italian publisher, accidentally described me one day as Cafe Latte. And I thought <laughs> that is a great nickname because frothy on top, but kind of <laughs> mental macchiato down below. Yeah. <laughs> this, is such, this is such an intricately plotted book. That must have given you enormous pleasure to, to, to sort out, especially as it's winding, winding its way down to the conclusion and you keep pulling the rug out from under us. That must have given oh, you enormous so pleasure. I'm so glad that worked for you because you know you, you, it's a risk, you know, especially that, <clears> that <throat> day scene where it, it, everything explodes, everything comes out on Christmas Day as the prawns are, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> going off in the sun. I oh, don't give the don't give me the ending away. Do not give the ending away. I won't give the away. Away. No, won't give the ending away. No, but no, you know, no. it's lovely when you build up. Well, the first part of the book's the hardest oh, bit because you're setting yeah. up all the premise. Yep. Once it's up and running, the second act is so much fun because you, you've got this like a, you know, the speed, you've got the speed up and then whoo, you race towards the end. I, and I love that. Yeah. So oh, you're, you're just the loveliest interviewer. You've been oh, thank you, Kathy. So charming. Well, you're an excellent oh, interviewee. Well, and I, was, and I was saying too, it's rare to have a man slip between my cupboards. My book cover. <laughs> And the fact that I gave you satisfaction is very... Oh, thrilling. you gave me enormous satisfaction. Multiple <laughs> satisfactions. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, what, what was the last book that made you cry? The last book that made me cry? Well, I've been reading a lot of Dickens in lockdown because I, yep. I didn't read it all when I... Because I left school so young. So, because Dickens makes me cry every time because the cruelty to children and also because... Um, he kills off his, he kills off characters. <clears throat> it's ruthless yeah. in that way. Characters you love. <laughs> so, I mean, I've just been reading all of them. Hard Times, Tale of Two Cities. I mean, I cried at the end of the Tale of Two Cities. I mean, obviously. So he's, I mean, he's a genius, genius writer. Mm. Just not a comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I cry every week when I see the, the bestseller list and I see it's all, and it's always the men. So oh, I'm very... No, you, no, you're on it now, Cathy. You're back I'm now. Yeah, number one in Aussie <laughs> adult, come on, Ciara time. So yeah, well, it's really exciting. Was there, a, was there a writer who made you want to write? Oh, definitely. Um, I would say uh, Vanity Fair, Thackeray. Oh, right. Book, my favourite book ever. Yeah, and, and also Jane Austen, because yeah. she's such a feminist, you know, beneath that kind of very... Uh, demure veneer and her social satire is so sharp oh I and, love Jane Austen uh, Emma is the nastiest book written <laughs> in the 19th century it it's really so is. so brilliant I try and read that once a year just just oh, to be you? made to feel uncomfortable because it makes me feel so uncomfortable I, know. I love but, it she but also because you know when you think of Lizzie Bennet in Pride and Prejudice who refuses to marry for yeah. um, for money. I mean, she's going to marry for love or she's not going to marry. This was a mm. radical thing to think at the time. Yeah. And, you know, her doppelganger, Bridget Jones, which is based on Pride and Prejudice, 
she, she, once this snooze alarm went off on her biological clock, she was no longer looking for Mr. Right, but Mr. Kind of Okay, Mr. Vaguely Bearable, Mr. Two Corpses Short of a Serial Killer. Yeah. Just to get so it's incredible to think that Jane Austen's creation was so much more radical than, than her modern doppelganger. So I love her. But Vanity Fair, if you haven't read Vanity Fair... Oh, no, I, I've read Vanity Fair. I, I love Thackeray. No, I'm just love saying Thackeray. to the audience, anyone oh, yes. out there yeah. hasn't read it, oh, Becky Sharp is the Madonna of her day. You know, lashings of chutzpah, cheek and charm, ruthless. She climbs the social ladders, lad by lad. <laughs> but if you think about it, when, when was that written? 1810 or something. What, yeah, he was, what, he was a contemporary, of, contemporary of Dickens. Yeah. And we had, they had not, there was no union. There was no, um, you know, there was no uh, social security. There was, there were no jobs. You could be probably be a, a factory worker or a, a, a governess or just a domestic slave. Yeah. So, so, you know, you can understand when you understand her background, why she was so, such a survivor, but that, that, I want to update that book. It would work. You could update it to any era because it's so brilliantly structured and the characters are just so fascinating and so fleshy. And the fact that one of my favourite female characters was written by a bloke amazes me. <laughs> but she's, she's just, oh, she's formidable. Yeah, I, I love her and I love that book. Yeah, and don't but take the shortcut of watching the film. It's, no, 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 no. It it's is nothing. It's, it so is all about beautiful. the language. Oh, it's all about it's all about the sentence. Love a good sentence. All about, I like a sentence. <laughs> I like to hold it up to the light and see it shine. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. Kathy, just Clark before just before we go, what's next? I mean, I know this is brand new, and this is just climbing up the charts, and it's all just happening. But I, I, you probably are planning ahead. What, well, what's I'm happening with this book that you can tell us? Is there anything you can tell us about this? Well, I can tell you that it's going to be made in well. It's going to be made into a movie. I've got about oh, three or four movie producers. I'm taking calls from Hollywood now. Okay, yeah, <laughs> what can I do for you? You know, <laughs> so I'm quite enjoying that stage of things, <laughs> and hopefully launch it other places around the world. Because after, as I said, after lockdown, what woman doesn't want to recycle her husband right now? <laughs> but I just hope, and then I'll get onto another novel, of course. But um, yeah. I only write because yeah. I'm cheaper than therapy. Obviously, I need a lot of therapy. So, yeah, <laughs> there'll be another book coming soon. But I just want women to take away from this um, the feeling that they, you know, that they can put themselves first for once and have some fun, have some frivolity, and just, you know, you bloody well earned it, girls. You bloody well deserve yeah. it. So go yeah. out and seize the day. That's what I want them to feel. But not just women, Cathy. You know, of course. Read this book. Men should read this book. They should. They should. <laughs> if they want to get better at girl talk, they should definitely read Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I, think, I just... Yeah. Sorry, go on. You go. Oh, I was just going to say, our time has come to... The hour has just completely flown by and our time has come to an end. I love talking to you. I could talk to you all day. You're so Oh, charming. likewise. Thank you so much. It's and hello to everybody. I'm pleasure. So I wish I was back there right now, you know. But it's I'll see you on the other side. Yes, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege. And I'd just like to say to the people who are watching this um, that you can, it's being recorded, so you can pick it up on the uh, Geelong Library website tomorrow, I believe. And copies of Husband Replacement Therapy are available to borrow from the Geelong Library as an e-book, because, of course, you can't, the library is, is closed. And of course, many bookstores are still trading and are offering online ordering and the book is for sale. Um, and please check out the library's Facebook page, which I can't do because I'm not on Facebook, for more upcoming events, including Heather Rose in conversation with Suzanne Leal next Wednesday night. And so, Kathy, on behalf of the library, thank you so much for giving us your time and for spending this hour with us from London. We really appreciate it. Thank you so it's much. Such a pleasure. Stay safe, everyone. Stay you sanitized. Too. The only dirty thing you can have is your mind. <laughs> okay. Good, good night, Kathy. We'll probably night, sit here, everyone. we'll probably sit here awkwardly waiting for them to end it. But we'll, we'll... we can just leave. We can just bye, leave. Bye, bye, yeah. Bye.